They have the biggest problem upcoming in the world of the aging population. Very soon, there was going to be 50 million people with dementia. People will say that China is better together, and that brings forward the one China policy. In the modern mind will include, of course, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Tibet, and Xinjiang, which are places of great political contention. It is essential that diplomacy is strengthened between China and America. There's just a lot of hawkish stupidness about not engaging with China. Who are you, Viviane Law? <laughs> Well, I am professionally a professor of Chinese history at University College London. Personally, I was born in London uh, to a mixed uh, parentage. So my father was Chinese uh, and um, my mother was English. My father was actually in later life, he became a rather famous cookery writer. So he wrote 40 Chinese cookery books and was a TV chef. So I, I grew up um, in that world of uh, cookery and um, history of China and philosophy, although I didn't speak Chinese. And so I learned Chinese uh, when I was at university. I was already 30. Uh, he spoke such good English. So I grew up in London and I have four children and five grandchildren. Um, and I'm about to retire. And um, I've been studying the history of Chinese medicine all my life. I've got many publications and um, a lot of martial arts in my life, actually. I, last night, I looked at your uh, Shaolin. I, I, I didn't really do much prep, but I did look at your Shaolin um, uh, podcast on YouTube. And that was quite interesting because uh, I've done so much martial arts myself. So, yeah, that's me. Wow, that's uh, that's an interesting life there. <laughs> so I I can't express you how excited uh, I am for the last one two years. I'm trying to find a person that understands uh, uh, Chinese history desperately. So finally, <laughs> I'm here. I made it. In, <laughs> I made my well, dream. Well, I, 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 uh, to it's interesting because I didn't understand anything Chinese as a child. I grew up in London, and um, I wasn't very interested in my father's history. But then, uh, after a while, um, I started doing martial arts, and uh, more and more, and then acupuncture, um, and then more and more, I uh, began to be interested. What was interesting for me was growing up in London. Um, the people who taught me Tai Chi. Uh, and martial arts, they were mostly white people, not, not Asians. And, um, and then even when I went to Cambridge to study Chinese language, it was not Chinese people who were teaching me. So it wasn't until I graduated that I began to think, oh, maybe these people are teaching me acupuncture and, and martial arts. They don't know much. So then I went to China and I studied with many Chinese people over the years. And, um, now I, uh, research the most ancient layer of things to do with Chinese movement, to do with health and, and medicine. So the Han Dynasty, mostly um, about 2,000 years ago, but also uh, medieval manuscripts too. So those are my obsessions. When I went to the um, uh, Chinese, uh, how we say, Shaolin Temple, uh, they... I, I learned some crazy things there that some Chinese people they hit their head uh, when they have a, a pain in their head. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so it was so absurd for me coming from the Western world that these uh, medical practices that they have uh, since a long time, as they explained me. So I'm very interested to dive into that. But ve first, I want to understand a bit. Uh, so we know the... A, a bit of history of the Western world, like uh, the how the Enlightenment came up, like the Romans, the Greeks, the all is is a bit more known. But as Westerners, we have no idea about China, about the the history of China. So I'm I'm very deeply interested to understand in a way that I understand uh, history of the Western world to understand China as well because it's increasingly more and more important in the world for obvious reasons. Yeah, I think one of the things um, that relates to your interest 
is that China has a different idea about how it is to be modern. So it really tries to embrace its classical world and with that, its classical medicine. So, for example, if you think about what happened during the pandemic, the president um, of China himself, Xi Jinping, um, was recommending that people take Chinese medical uh, 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 remedies for COVID for both prevention and for treatment. What the, and that's what does something that, that you never remedies? see. Hmm? What does that mean, Chinese remedies? Uh, so it was uh, pills, formulated remedies, which are, um, I can't remember exactly which one it was, but there were various ones that became very fashionable to take uh, in China as a way of, and, the, and they're mixed remedies, so many different herbs put together into a pill. Um, so, um, so it did uh, similar effect that the vaccine did? to the Western world in a way? Um, a very different process to a vaccine. Uh, and it would be accumulated knowledge about the ways in which those herbs can treat uh, things like heat in the body or uh, weakness or um, the sorts of remedies that we used for um, many, many years for treating cold-like symptoms, flu-like symptoms, that sort of thing. So. Um, it, it was remedies that would strengthen your body, but also um, deal with the symptoms of, of, of the illness too. And that's actually very good uh, for the long COVID because uh, one thing that um, China has been doing for 2,000 years and more is um, looking for remedies and recipes, whether they're pills, medicines, or techniques like, like Shaolin Kung Fu, um, they're, they're, they're really for strengthening the body. So uh, rather than curing illness, they're about um, uh, tonifying your constitution, strengthening your kidneys particularly. Mm -hmm. They're always interested, Chinese are always interested in the kidneys because the kidneys were thought to be the store of the um, most fundamental um, vitality in the body. So um, that's partly what they do. So how did you go and understood uh, the history? You personally, you read books, you spoke with people, you went to China and asked people. How did you read and understand about all these things? Okay, there was, there was a point, I think, as a, a teenager, it's often with immigrant um, families that you lose, the children are not really that interested in uh, the parents because they're trying to, we're trying to fit in locally with the local kids. And so, you know, when I was young, um, didn't have much interest, but I did have an uncle who was in New York and he was studying and teaching classical Chinese philosophy, literature and that sort of thing. He would turn up every year in the summer and he would give me one lesson. So he'd give me one lesson of classical Chinese and it was enough. You know, sometimes when you have crazy kids, you just need to do one thing. And it... Um, it, it really uh, helped me to, it sparked an interest and that interest probably um, came to fruition about 20 years later because I was a crazy kid. You know, I was, um, I was uh, doing all the crazy things, sex, drug and rock, rock and roll as a, as a teenager. And it wasn't until I was 20 and it was through martial arts actually that, um, that I kind of straightened my head out. And um, I had been doing Tai Chi um, with an Australian woman uh, from the age of about 13. And so that was part of my, my, my cool life, you know, that, that, that Tai Chi seemed to be quite a cool thing to do after, you know, a night of drugs, that Tai Chi was something that put my head straight. And so it was really at 20 that I gave all of that up. And so for for had people that they don't know, uh, can you explain briefly what Tai Chi is? Because... A lot of people are not familiar at all with the culture of China. Mm. So uh, me, mm. me included before I went to China. Okay. So what's interesting, you asked about the Shaolin hard, you know, it's pretty tough that Shaolin. Um, and they do lots of things that harden your body. Um, and, you know, they beat themselves with things. And I saw, and, you, and they, they knock their head against uh, steel things. Now, that's very different to uh, what we know as Tai Chi, uh, Tai Chi Chuan. Um, and what you're seeing there is an Indian tradition that came in with Buddhism, um, and it developed rather late. But what I do and I study is a much softer 
kind of Tai Chi. And uh, it's, a, it's a form that um, is not aggressive. It's very much uh, a way of fighting without um, doing the first strike action. So you're always responding to the aggression of, 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 of your opponent. Um, and it's a way of manipulating the chi of the world. And chi is the big question, what is chi? But uh, chi is a sort of sensory world within which uh, one feels um, energizing the vitality, uh, which is shared with the universe around. So it's it, it comes in on you, the breath. You need to explain me a bit more about the chi because they use this word so much. I had yeah. no clue. And nobody like, really knows chi, what it your, is. <laughs> your chi, like <laughs> so. Uh, I, I have uh, a particular, um, a particular understanding of the chi, and it's because I, 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 I do all of this translation and analysis of ancient world manuscripts, and in that, what I see is that the chi in martial arts or in health um, and therapeutic exercise is a sensory world. It's about understanding your body through feeling it. So your experience of um, uh, feeling good, you know, what do, if you close your eyes, you know, we are dominated by the eyes in, 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 in Europe and the West by what we see. But if you close your eyes, where does your body begin and end? It's very hard to say. You know, you, you have some senses around your skin, but actually it's your digestion, it's your where your heart is, it's, um, it's not really so much in your head unless you're really stressed out by thinking. Uh, and so when people talk about qi, it's about that inner sensory world. And when you do exercise, uh, um, with, especially with breathing, you can begin to feel your body in a different way. And that's the joy of chi. It's uh, it's about participating and controlling the inner world, um, and that includes emotions. So when you breathe, if you're very feeling very emotional, feeling very upset, um, and you breathe and you try and bring the chi down in your body. So it's about bringing the sort of sense of a downward movement, like water, in your body. Uh, so uh, the water can be really calming and the idea of water, but also the image of water flowing through your body um, is, is a very powerful sort of meditational technique. So qi is about feeling that process, feeling um, your inner body and calming your inner body and using the natural world around you to calm your inner body. And um, what I love particularly is um, the ways in which the martial arts uh, mimic the external world. So um, you bring all of the elements of the external world into your body, or you copy the movement of animals, for example, because they're so efficient in their movement. Um, I don't know if you ever did anything like the bear walk when you were doing Kung Fu. Um, so, you know, walking like the bear is a way of strengthening your lower back. Uh, that's what they always say. And uh, if have you ever seen a bear walk on its hind legs? Uh, yeah, it's kind of funny, weird. It, it, it's, its head slightly forward and it's got short back legs. So it's very grounded um, and it sort of has this very powerful, strong walk. My father used to do it. Um, it was a very funny story where uh, I was probably about eight or nine. And, you know, my father was different anyway. He was Chinese and we were living in the suburbs and um, suffering a lot of racism at that time, actually. But um, then he, he used to do the bear walk and he'd walk. I remember seeing him walking along Waterloo Station platform and thinking, that's not my dad. <laughs> that's not my dad and hiding because he was embarrassing. But then uh, years later, I began to do the bear walk. And, uh, and it's so empowering. It's so wonderful. Um, and people in China, you often see them... Uh, in groups walking in the park together and they're doing things like that, you know, uh, walking like a bear or rising like a dragon or hanging like a monkey. Um, and so a lot of these exercises are about integrating oneself with the world around us. 
um, and um, and drawing on it, being empowered by that. Um, uh, and so what you see in the ancient world is a lot of observation of the environment and attuning the body with what they thought of as heaven and earth, um, yin and yang, um, and uh, harmonizing that within the body. Is that any clearer or more confusing? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I think you need to get confused first to be able to understand. <laughs> mm. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm, I want to take, I have a question about, uh, you mentioned that uh, you, you have experienced races when you were younger. Can you elaborate briefly about that? Like what does that look like in your age in UK being uh, what did racism this? look like in the UK oh goodness me um well actually uh, I grew up with uh, uh Ghanaians and so there was a uh, um black and Asian people in my household in a totally white environment um for a while we lived in Surrey which was a very white suburb and so it looked like fighting on the streets actually Um, and um, my brothers particularly became street fighters in that time just because we were attacked regularly. Um, it, racism happens in so many different ways. I have done quite a lot of work with people on uh, racism against East Asians because um, I think that there is a growing awareness of, of the, the damage that, um, uh, that racism against black people in England and black and South Asian people, Indians, uh, um, uh, experience, but very little about against East Asians. And so it's about being called names. <laughs> and in a way, um, you know, one accepted that because in the 70s, 60s, 70s, when I was growing up, um, I was a chink, called a chink, and people would make fun of my name. What? Chink. What chink. Chink. Means? It's a kind of rude name. For Chinese, um, okay, it's like the awful name word "nigger" for Chinese, uh, okay. and so um, you grow up thinking you're different um, and as assuming that that's the way the world is. And it took me really into my teenage years to to fight fight back. And then with my brothers and I, we were fighting back all the time. Hence, martial arts were very important to me and gentle martial arts were very important to me. Uh, then I moved as a, when I was 15, you know, I left home and I, le I moved to London and life was much easier in London because uh, it's such a much more mixed environment. So I've always been much happier there. Um, so what did it mean? It meant fighting. It meant um, uh, fighting back for me, really. Um, and then also... Uh, learning more about my culture, learning my history um, and being able to understand my father's story um, and um, not something that was obvious to understand as a child, but something that um, has become a kind of um, quest in my life and, uh, um, um, and my pre professional life, as you see now as well, um, my interest in Chinese history. So can you give me a brief uh, synopsis of Chinese history? <laughs> oh, <laughs> gosh. <laughs> Phidias. Okay, brief synopsis of Chinese history. Um, well, the key points um, that I think you'd be interested in are there is what is considered by many to be a sort of axial age in the uh, spring and autumn and warring states period, which is going back um, before, before the common era. So we're into a period of sort of uh, 600 down to 200 BC. And uh, that's a time when um, people have argued that there's something equivalent to ancient Greece going on. So the, all the, many of the philosophers are from this period. Confucius in the earliest period. And then um, you have the philosophers that later get picked up by Taoism uh, as their sort of um, great writers and they become, Lao Tzu particularly becomes, becomes sainted. You know, he becomes a, a god in his own right. But then 
in that early period they were writers and they their that 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 Taoist philosophy is rather different to the Confucian philosophy. Uh, Confucius was uh, very much a humanitarian or human not humanitarian but human humanist. Um, so that he didn't really know want, want to know about the spirits. He wanted to know about social order and hierarchies. And um, he's very much still beloved by the Communist Party, but reinvented for the modern world. Uh, in its time, it was about, you know, the top is the emperor, and then you have the father, and then you have the sons, and the women, of course, are down below. Um, and that one has to maintain that social order through ritual. Now, with the, the philosophers that became Taoist philosophers and related to the Taoist church, um, you have uh, Lao Tzu, who's rather mythical, and Zhuang Tzu, and they are the philosophers who, who believe um, in... Can I, can I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Lao Tzu is the one that wrote the book about war. That's the... No, that's Sun Tzu, the Sun Tzu being father. Sun. The, yeah. Lao Tzu is the one who wrote the book called The, the, the Way and the Power, and he talks a lot about the way. And you will have heard about the way if you've been doing any martial arts, the Tao, the Tao. And so uh, Tao simply means the way. But it is uh, within the Taoist philosophy, uh, the way in which you should move is the way of nature. It's the way of the planet. It's almost as if there is a way that is not in any conflict with the rest of the world. And in order to achieve the movement of the way, you have to uh, move with the universe. And there is a sort of path, which is a path which has no conflict in the world and that one can uh, move with it. Um, and partly all this cultivation, self-cultivation, breath, breath meditations and movement is a way of moving through the world without causing conflict. Um, and so that's where you have the martial arts where you don't attack, you're just following the aggression of your partner in order to achieve um, successful, um, correct movement, like the planets move or like the animals move. So there's no uh, contest. Uh, one of the most beautiful images in, in, in that um, way and the power is that the highest good is like water. It seeks the lowest place. It fills the containers. It doesn't have a form. And that one seeks to follow that movement to be like water. Because water is the most powerful thing and it is the most, um, uh, it is the most malleable thing. But, you know, a tsunami is more powerful than any other element in the world. Um, and it's like women. It's the yin to fire, which is the yang, if you like. So you asked me about Chinese history. You've only got to the earliest layer. Um, and then what you have is the unification of what we know as China under the, the uh, first emperor, who is Qin Shi Huangdi. Uh, and he comes from out the West. And um, he basically unifies the warring states because there were many kingdoms um, in, 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 in conflict at that time. So this is one of the biggest philosoph philosophical questions, which remains very powerful an issue today. Uh, it, it, people will say that China is better together. And that brings forward the one China policy, that China is more peaceful, um, but that it needs a strong ruler when it is unified. And so that, in the modern mind, will include, of course, Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, and Tibet, and Xinjiang, which are places of great political contention. But that issue begins way back in 221 BC, when the first emperor, who is famously a brutal person and a warmonger, wins the contest to control China. And from that point onwards, in theory, China was unified. In practice, there were many times where it fragmented um, and there were um, periods when there were many small kingdoms um, uh, which were contesting for, uh, for unifying China. But the ultimate prize was always unification. 
and the political. The, the, and, and the other thing is that one of the things that marks China out and has been a unifying factor in China for 2,000 years and more was its civil service. It has this amazing civil service and the civil service examinations, um, which were the process through which anybody in theory could uh, achieve um, a glorious uh, professional history as a civil servant. Mostly they were tax collectors. So they were people who went all around the empire collecting money. And, um, and so they also uh, administered the country. And so there's always this little bit of tension between very powerful rulers and this massive civil service whose interest is in holding the status quo. And they were the ones who passed down Chinese culture, Chinese philosophy, Chinese education. And so you see that now, even now, uh, that in Xinjiang, which is um, largely a Muslim territory, uh, there is the re-education centers of, in how to be Chinese. So this idea of a unified China is something that was promoted by this social class of civil servants. Uh, in actual fact, China is an extremely diverse place. How could it not be? You know, if you look at the the geographic situation uh, and the climate situation in North China, you know, and the Mongolian uh, territories, um, it's a very different place to to what you know of Hong Kong and the sort of humid uh, southern territory. And the peoples are very different. They have so many different languages um, uh, in China. It's not just one language. So um, this unification and the whole drive and desire for unification um, really begins in 221 BC. So then the empire goes on to 1911. Um, obviously, there were periods of disunion, but essentially there is a kind of... So how many years is that? So it's... 2,000 uh, years. More than 2,000 two, years. years. Wow. Hmm. So that... So the... Wow, that the equivalent of two thousand years. Even Rome, I don't think in the it's Western back to world, Rome exactly. Rome. Well, the Roman Empire overstretched itself and collapsed. Um, and uh, with China, definitely there was times of fragmentation. So it wasn't always one political rule that went all the way through. But um, and there were there were in medieval times. You have a lot of northern empire emperors who uh, come from a sort of Turkic origin. And then you also have the Mongolian Empire. Um, and so there were foreign rulers, if you like, but they became integrated. It's, uh, there is this kind of concept within which China is a sort of centrifugal force. It draws people in. And um, oh, well, yeah, one, one funny way of thinking about it is that all those... Uh, um, foreign empires, so the Turkic emperors and the um, Mongolian emperors, what they needed out of China was the tax collection. So they needed to control that civil service and they took on that civil service. Um, and eventually, and they also married Chinese, Chinese um, women. And so after a few generations, they disappear. <laughs> they become Chinese. What do you mean? Because, because oh. the they become Chinese through 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 mixed marriages, but also because they want to become Chinese. Because as you become Chinese, you 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 do the tax collection and you become wealthy. So you know slowly um, uh, the um, the foreign influence so, becomes absorbed into Chineseness, a plural Chinese identity. Uh, so uh, again, what was the incentive that that happened? Like uh, that the foreigners came to rule there and collected tax and they became one with the Chinese. Why that happened exactly? I'm not sure if I understand. Uh, because obviously they want to um, have the benefits of the rule of the whole empire so that both that has a military aspect, uh, but it also has a, a financial aspect. So the tax collection uh, makes the state makes your rule extremely powerful, you know, and you also enjoy all the fruits of, of Chinese, uh, e extraordinary Chinese technical culture with all its fantastic technologies of, of you know, wonderful clothes and, and, and um, 
porcelain and um, salt and uh, in enormous scientific advances that you have in China. And that's one thing, actually, that um, uh, I think is really important, is that the, the technological wizardry of China is amazing. You know, that Francis Bacon um, said there were a number of different signs of modernity. Um, and in a way, China had them very early on and way before Europe. So it had gunpowder, it had the magnetic compass, it had the printing press. Um, and so uh, all these things arrived in China without that larger enlightenment and, and, um, and um, massive progress. So that we you, saw. Have, you have the printing press, the China a lot before the Western world had the printed... Yeah, I think several hundred years. And what's interesting is that it was probably sponsored by a woman, the Empress Wu Zetian, um, around the 8th, 9th hundreds. And um, what she, the reason why she was doing it was because she was printing sutras, Buddhist sutras, because the more sutras you printed... <laughs> The more like the more, the stronger your dynasty was in bringing the um, basically it, it, it's a kind of a Buddhist theory of kingship, and the more merit that you can produce by producing uh, by printing sutras, the stronger your dynasty was related to the cosmos, and therefore um, she printed. She was very strongly Buddhist towards the end of her life. And um, she wanted the printing of the sutras. And so some of the earliest printed texts in the world um, uh, were produced in Dunhuang, which is in the um, northwest of China um, and uh, near to the, the Taklamahan Desert, Gobi Desert area. Um, and so this is of the Diamond Sutra. Um, which is obviously a Buddhist sutra, and so this had been this had been um, uh, um, de the technology of printing was developing very fast in that period, um, and so you know uh, I think what um, uh, Bacon was thinking was that the printing press was was part of the democratization of knowledge that that we produced so many uh, texts and um, and uh, that would popularize knowledge more generally, so it was no longer elite and in the monasteries or uh, confined to an elite scholarly group. But actually in this context, uh, in, in the Chinese context, it was initially because of the dissemination of religion and the Buddhist religion particularly. So can you paint me a picture? Uh, so you said 800 uh, half, uh, up before 1,200 years ago, uh, that the printing press started uh, there. Can you pin me a bit Well, printing, no, printing, of... actually, printing. So uh, initially um, that printing probably is it, not a printing press, but by the Song period, 1100, we, we are seeing, we're seeing the printing press um, very clearly producing a lot of texts and books. So a very new so, process. So, so the difference between printing and print to press is that they... Yeah. What is there would have been some hand printing before the printing press, the printing press. And with the, with the Chinese printing press, you'd have movable print. So um, uh, basically each one of the characters would be produced separately and then you could move them around um, and create new texts through that. And so, for example, the texts that I know best, of course, are the medical texts. And most of them, the classics of Chinese medicine, um, were printed in the Song period, so 11, 1200s, that sort of time. Um, and, um, and so what's interesting is uh, we thought that the printing press had then eradicated the manuscript culture. So the handwritten manuscripts um, were less valued after the printing press arrived um, because people were collecting books um, and books were in the end, cheaper to produce. Um, but then way back in the Han period, which is 2,000 years ago, people were buried with their libraries. So they had these yeah, extraordinary um, uh, funeral mortuary practices. You've probably seen the first emperor's 
tomb, have you? Have you seen images of the pottery warriors? You haven't seen them? So he, had a, he was buried with the life-size army, the first emperor. So he was so paranoid about what was going to happen to him in, after his death that he built another life um, underground for his tomb. And so the first emperor's um, tomb, is it, it covers kilometers and life-size pottery armies and um, incredible uh, funerary items which probably he felt he needed in order to be as powerful in the next world. And, and, he was, and maybe that was true and he actually became very powerful in the other world. Well, he, he, certainly we his memory know. became very powerful and you know, he still stands <laughs> as a, a key figure. Um, and China still thinks, you know, I think that uh, many people, the majority of people in China still feel that they need a strong ruler um, because that brings peace. And it's true because immediately before him, there was a, a terrible war. So, um, and if China disintegrates, then um, there is always terrible war. Um, so it's, it's, so it's, this it's is a the guy that you mentioned. Issue. This is, this is the guy that you mentioned that he was the first that united uh, China uh, yes, 2,000 yes. years ago? So he's a complex figure because people say, well, he was brutal. He was, uh, he was brutal and his dynasty only lasted... What, what's his, his, his name again? Qin Shi Huangdi, uh, the, the first emperor of Qin. And his name was Zheng, actually. His personal, his personal name was Zheng, King Zheng, before he became the first emperor. Um, and um, he's complex because because he's brutal and, and, and his he dynasty. Was, he was he was a Westerner uh, person. No, no, just from uh, the west country? the west part of China. He was from the west part of China, oh, okay. um, and um, he had this amazing army, and um, he uh, basically had a sort of war machine whereby he promoted um, the commoner peasant and the, um, uh, the soldier. These were the two important people, um, groups of people that he, he really promoted. He was very anti-Confucian um, and um, he uh, believed in the rule of law. So it was a brutal kind of law and it was a brutal kind of warfare. And so this was always forever after a complicated thing in the Chinese mind because, um, because uh, the next dynasty was equally military, but it was the one that began to consolidate the civil service that I already talked about. And that civil service it was, has really been a key feature in the longevity of the Chinese empire. You know, any, whoever controlled the civil service was the one who controlled the money, essentially, and the, the and wealth. And that's the same at, two, at this year as well? Well, in a sense, yes. You have a very strong ruler at the moment under Xi Jinping. Uh, well, we'll see really how strong he is, but he's certainly um, keeping a tight control over China. And um, the... And the civil service and the um, the Communist Party generally, yeah, um, and he's promoting the One China policy very strongly. So you can see the uh, um, recurrence of that. And what's interesting too is there has been a, an enormous revival of religions in China in recent years. Um, you see, actually, I think I think it's true to say that even Christianity is uh, stronger in China this right now than anywhere else in the world. You know, the rate of conversion, you know, as people become more and more secular in America and um, uh, Europe, I think that's true to say, although there's some pretty extreme religious organizations, but in, in China, people become more and more religious. So there's a revival of, 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 of Taoism and Buddhism um, and Islam, but um Christianity also has taken quite a big hold in China. Um, so that's a very interesting kind of way in which people uh, demand a certain personal freedom to 
um, express their religious beliefs. Um, it's quite str strictly controlled in China, but um, um, it is essentially a secular socialist state. Um, so there's these sort of contradictions that, that happen um, underneath this strong China policy. People choose to express themselves religiously in different ways. Yeah. It's very interesting that China is moving in different directions that the world is moving now. Mm, mm, mm. Indeed. Uh, can you pin? Uh, can you go a bit one step back of the history because you left an important part, I believe, of how do we have when is the history of China starting? And do we have first Chinese people? They always was Chinese. It was like Mongols or something. How, how does that work? Okay, that's that's an interesting. That's a very interesting question. So we can't. We mustn't forget this this key date of two two one BC, which when the first emperor um, unified China. So before that, there isn't really a China, or maybe there is. So that's a big question. And it's a question that I ask my students, you know, when did China begin? <laughs> so we don't have this word, uh, Zhongguo, which is China, um, until really uh, around that period of um, the beginning of um, the Chinese state in 221 BC. But there are certain elements of Chinese culture that you can date much earlier than that. So, for example, writing. Uh, when did the first sort of semblance of a Chinese writing begin? And that's really, uh, we have a lot of evidence from around 1600 BC in the Shang period, in what we call the Shang dynasty. Maybe it goes back even, uh, much earlier before the Shang dynasty, but around um, 1600, uh, you're beginning to get the earliest kind of writing. And that's really interesting because it happens on... Um, the scapula of cows, that's the bone, this bone here, uh, so cow bone, and turtle carapace, so turtle turtle shells. And it's sort of, uh, it's incised, the writing is incised into these bones and, 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 and shells. And it's, the writing that we have is mostly uh, divinations, and the divinations are done uh, for the king, the, the Shang kings, and they ask things to do with uh, the state, with the running of the state. Uh, like, for example, shall we go to war? Or um, uh, who is responsible for the king's illness? And that would be an ancestor, like a dead, a, a dead relative. Um, so the idea was that one got ill because of a curse, of the one of the king's ancestors, for example, um, and a lot of the time they're asking things to do with prediction of is the king going to have a son or this sort of thing. Um, and so, after the uh, the divination was performed by putting this hot rod into the shell or to the bone, and then it cracks, and then the diviner would read the cracks. And after the divination was um, uh, resolved and interpreted, then it would be written in the earliest writing on um, on you know it would be carved into these these bones and carapaces. This is not that early as writing goes. You've got much earlier writing in Egypt and um, and sort of um, Central Asia, uh, West Asia, but um, th there is a lot of it. So. These divinations were then kept in a sort of library, or uh, you know, in a in a in a um, some kind of enclave, and and then we they were found actually first of all in the nineteenth century and um, in Chinese medical shops because people thought they were dragon bones. They were finding these bones with 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 mysterious inscriptions on. And so they were saying these are dragon bones and they ground it up and, and served it up as Chinese medicine for uh, various ailments. But then people slowly realized, archaeologists, you know, with the advent of archaeology, they began to realize that 
these were ancient writings from the Shang dynasty, and now they can date them with uh, you know, modern scientific techniques of dating um, uh, to you know around between sixteen hundred. How, how, how many years ago the, uh, those bones uh, exist? So sixteen hundred BC. So we're talking about three to four thousand years ago. So you believe that that's where the first real Chinese culture started? There are many kinds of cultures. Uh, so there's a writing system, some of which is recognizable, but you can you can you can you can uh, chart the change of the characters. Um, one of the things that that first emperor did uh, was standardize many things. So one of the things he standardized was writing systems. Um, and the writing system, there were many writing systems before that time. Um, and so uh, the standard writing systems were um, uh, um, from 221 BC. The Shang writing systems um, have some elements which are still recognizable, but uh, also you have many things like st life structuring elements like the calendar that the Shang period um, Uh, developed. So they had a particular calendar, which you can see being used all the way through the imperial period. So in a sense, Chineseness begins then because the calendar is so important in relation to, you know, like agricultural world and, um, and tax collection, particularly, because if you are going to collect tax, you have to tell people when you're going to come and get it. And so the calendar, the, 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 the importance of standardizing the calendar Um, was um, part of that civil service activity that um, I talked about. So that happened 2,000 years ago with the coming of and start the standardization. The first emperor, standard, that first emperor. The yeah, the of standard. the first emperor. But then three to, so 1600 BC, they were beginning to create this language, which is then uh, nearly 4,000 years old. But the, the standardization of the script Um, happened um, uh, importantly in uh, uh, the Qin Dynasty, which is um, 221 BC, so just a little over 2,000 years ago. One important point about China is the population of China. When the population started arising like that, and it was always like that, um, big relative to other places, Well, because it's a massive territory. Um, well, it's not bigger than the United States, though, I, I, I think, or maybe it is, but, uh, but uh, it's a lot. Uh, I'm not sure. I think people. it's bigger than, I think it's bigger than the United States. It may not be bigger than the Soviet Union in its, in its biggest, I, I can't, I, I can't be sure. But in any case, um, I don't have the figures, the population figures at my uh, fingertips right now, but, but um During periods of peace, China's population grows really rapidly. Um, and so um, really the population of China has grown exponentially in the 20th century, even though there were terrible to, to cut you to answer To cut you to answer the question that you have, I just Google uh, who is bigger in my million okay. square kilometers and... It's United States is bigger, uh, so it's 9.8 million square kilometers, and China is 9.6 square kilometers. So it's not much difference. Is, it's pretty, yeah. pretty much the same. But yeah, but, the um, same. Yeah. Um, so China's population, why is it so big? Um, well, partly because I would say because it has been predominantly until relatively recently an agricultural population. So there is uh, import it's important to have sons sons were really important in china so the more children you have the better now it's really interesting because china suffered some terrible wars in the last 200 years and some terrible famines um, not the least the famine of the 1950s which was pretty much a um a, a government induced you know a lot of government mistakes Uh, where millions of people died, and the Japanese war, Japanese army massacred so many people. Um, but it bounces back, and it bounces back because of in periods of peace, 
people used to produce um, large families. Now they don't anymore, and Chinese population is set to reduce rather radically over the next period. And they've, they've suddenly introduced this. Um, you know, we had the one-child policy, I think, from the until twenty uh, seventies right? onwards. Sorry, until twenty fifteen. Yes, and then we have the two-child policy, and then rapidly the three-child policy. And the problem is for the government. I mean, obviously, the reason for that is because it's a, a rapidly aging population, and so the I, I saw one statistic, but don't quote me on it. But but um, that that there was going to be um, very soon fifty million people with dementia. So that's the that's almost the size of the population of England. With dementia, now you can imagine how much money that's going to take to look after those people, and really, there's not going to be enough young people working and paying tax in order to, in order to sustain that. So they have one of the biggest, uh, the biggest problem, upcoming in the world of the aging population, um, and so. Um, So that population, that demographic challenge is something that is, you know, they talk, the young kids that I teach, I teach many Chinese students, they have this, what they call the one, two, four problem. That's one child, two, grand, two, two parents, and four grandparents. So that's the responsibility for each child. Um, and, and so in China, it's it's not like the United States. The kids need to look after their parents and their grandparents. They are, there is a moral, like a, ethical a, responsibility uh, that is you know long standing that you should look after your parents, and um, and so that's a real dilemma for the kids, and um, and so what are they going to do about it? This is still isn't clear at all. Um, And, uh, and 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 it continues to fall because because China's urban population is becoming more and more middle class. So middle class populations tend to have less children because they have greater aspirations for their children. They want to pay for their education. They want to, you know, make sure they've got a house. They're not jamming, you know, ramming six children into a small shack because they need to be plowing the land anymore. Women are becoming more important, and in part, that's because um, there are less women than men, and that's sadly because uh, it's a very interesting phenomenon that uh, with a book, with with with, with um, technologies that you can, you can see that there are, um, you know, the gender of your child, there are more girl children, girl fetuses that are being aborted because people still have this old mindset that they want boys really But, yeah and, and wow that's something that is changing a bit with the two or three you know the, the two or three child policy but you know you didn't know really if you were wow. going to have a, you didn't know really wow. if you were going to have a girl um uh before the you know the, the yes, scanning technology that, that, that makes sense one father let's say Uh, if you have a man, it will be a lot more, let's say, productive for you, your lands, for your all this stuff. If uh, but that that was their perception. Interesting. Mm. Wow, this is the craziest thing I heard the whole month. Uh, mm. Of of uh, so it's, it's it's wow. I cannot. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's a big question actually as to when a human being in China in in China when did, when is a human being a human being, you know, and the um, the technology for being able to see the fetus has changed so much um, that of course when the fetus is is viable, you know, when you can actually deliver the fetus and it's able to live on its own, that tends to be. The uh, the definition of when a human being becomes a human being, um, in its own right, with human rights, for example, um, and so with China it didn't change. I'm not quite sure what the law is, but I think it is. You know, basically, you're a human being when you're born, um, rather than you're a human being when you're inside your mother. 
Um, so um, don't particularly quote me on that, but I think that that's the case. That the, the law the law is different anyway in every every different country as to when a human being becomes a human being. It's that, that's interesting. I think uh, you are right. Uh, so the chances of becoming a boy and a girl, I think. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I heard I think in the past that is a bit more likely to become a girl than a boy. Slightly likely, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, let, let's say it's 50, there are more 50. women than more women than men. I think you're right, um, but then of course that is uh, and, adjusted and, by, and I, by by personal choice uh, in China. And who, and I see here want... that there is 720 million males and 690 million females. On that large scale of of population, it yes. should kind of be even in in a way. Mm. So, mm. so yeah, wow, that's a but lot what of that abortions, does, right? I mean, that, there. That's a very sad and tragic thing, and a tragic uh, sort of gender prejudice that remains in China. But on the other hand, it means women become more and more valued, and uh, women's status is growing <laughs> much <laughs> greater and faster than men's. That's- uh, and That's also they funny. have much more mobility. They're moving to the towns and they're marrying up. Um, but what that leaves is a very dangerous situation in the countryside where you have single men, um, large quantities of single men in the countryside. That's a dangerous situation for China. Because Wh- Why is it dangerous? Large men who can't, large quantities of men in the countryside with no education and no sex is a problem. That's a simple way of putting it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, that's a real problem. It's a real problem. Hmm. Uh, so recently when I've been to China, I was talking with a girl and she told me that uh, being a girl in China is uh, and getting married is not a good deal anymore because you need to provide from your for your uh, for your husband you your husband's family yes <laughs> your husband's family is like the only thing that you get is just a couple of money per month to barely survive in a way so from your husband so yes she's saying that i prefer to not get married and she was kind of rebellious about that so i prefer to yes, not there get are married lots of, there prefer- are lots of there are lots of op- options life options that are opening up in china so i was just reading recently um actually on the bbc news that that um, that actually being a single mother is becoming a, a viable proposition for uh, people in the in the cities, and that's really was a, a taboo. Um, if you didn't have a husband, then you know there's a terrible prejudice. There has been a terrible prejudice against what they call leftover women. You know, people who are over thirty uh, and not married. But then I think that there's a backlash against that, uh, and these leftover women are claiming their right to be, uh, well, their status of, as independent and, and um, uh, you know, single-minded uh, uh, women. So I think there is a revolution, a gender revolution going on in China. Um, I would say in the cities, uh, it doesn't so much uh, extend to the countryside where old-style prejudices still, still certainly exist. So can I get you back to the topic of the last 200 years that you started uh, talking and I interrupted you like an asshole? Uh, uh, the last 200 years of, uh, of history in China, you said there is a lot of conflict. Can you explain me some of the effect that that had in the country, some of the, what, uh, how that affected the country and can you maybe explain some of the conflict? Okay, so um, there was, this is the Qing dynasty we're talking about, which is the Manchu dynasty. Uh, It's one of the foreign dynasties because that's people who come from the northeast of China. Um, And uh, they were um, basically in power through the 19th century. And uh, one of the things that happens during that time is there are the Opium Wars, uh, 1840s. Um, And uh, they have never, China's rather proud that they've never actually been colonized. So 
they don't really acknowledge this colonial history. But then on the other hand, uh, the Opium Wars uh, ended with the foreign powers taking reparations against China. So China's, uh, and they happened mainly because China was exporting so much. And so the balance of, of financial power was in China's favor. And so basically the Opium Wars were a way of um, Britain and the foreign powers redressing that uh, imbalance. Um, and so um, China is weakened. China is getting weakened anyway internally. There's uh, lots of rebellions happening. There are famines happening. Um, and and so there's also a strong um, a strong drive internally to respond to that and to modernize. Towards the end of the 19th century, you're getting a rapid modernization in Japan, much faster than in China, because it's coming from the top down. Uh, so the emperors in Japan are demanding a, 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 a form of modernization, which, which works rather quickly. Whereas in China, the, um, the last emperors were resisting that. Uh, and so, uh, and so nobody was really, uh, um, nobody, re nobody was really, uh, 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 getting a foreign education. So actually my own family is, um, is it was very uh, involved in that history. My great grandfather built the first modern navy. He was the director of the Fujo Dockyard, and he studied in London, which is how come I ended up in London. And um, and so that was the 1860s. He arrived in London to learn navigation and to um, uh, do diplomacy. So actually, there was a lot of social mobility of those people who were uh, learning technology. Um, who learned foreign languages and became suddenly very important when China had to do diplomacy uh, and had to have ambassadors. So he became the ambassador from the Qing court to, to London. Um, and so there's a group of people that are clamoring for reform, um, but they're not really very successful. Uh, they're wanting still to keep the Chinese empire, but... Um, uh, uh, but uh, they, they, so it's not really radical reform they want. They basically want to steal the secrets of, of the West in order to build their, their military technology and their naval technology. Um, and so um, there is a very strange story that happens, uh, the Taiping Rebellion. So this is coming after the Opium Wars. Um, whereby when was the Opium Wars? Uh, how, um, how many the years? The Opium ago? Wars are 1840s, ending around the 50s, um, and then okay. uh, the Taiping Rebellion. You can look that up for me while I'm talking about it. <laughs> I, I'm very bad on dates. I don't remember dates. I have to look them up. Um, so, with the, the Taiping Rebellion is coming in the 1850s, I believe. You can confirm that. Uh, Taiping, T A I P I N G, <laughs> and um, Essentially, that's beginning uh, with a, a convert to Christianity who believes that he is Jesus Christ's brother. Um, and he basically mobilizes from South China and um, uh, they take over the dynasty in the mid-50s, I think, the Taiping Tianguo. Um, yes, 18, uh, 1850 to 60. Yes. So uh, they actually completely uh, take over from the Qing dynasty just for this very short period. Um, and he's called Hong, Hong something. Um, and so um, this really weird movement of uh, Christians that it, it's Christianity grafted onto a Hakka culture. Uh, and the Hakka culture, actually, I'm a Hakka myself. My father was a Hakka. Um, they are, uh, at that point, they were in South China, and um, they have a kind of uh, history of uh, being spirit mediums and trances and that sort of thing. So uh, this Christianity is grafted onto that kind of uh, spiritualist world. And, um, and so uh, they have a particular community with all its rituals and beliefs and uh and it just just takes over China by storm, uh, an ex extraordinary movement. Um, and it really uh, embraced not only 
the peasantry, the, the farming people, but also uh, quite elite people too. And what it is really responding to is a vacuum of weakness uh, in the imperial China at that time. Um, so it's not my particular period, so I don't have my own opinion about why everything had fallen apart by that time. Um, but, you know, the Qing dynasty had been a very strong dynasty, but by that time um, uh, it was becoming extremely weak. The emperors were, were weakened. Um, and so uh, this uh, revolution absolutely took over China and devastated China. Millions of people died. You know, I think it puts the Second World War to, you know, so many more people, millions of people. Um, and so then you have 1911, the end. This is uh, way beyond now the Taiping. I mean, 50 years later, uh, what you see is um, a continuously weakened China. Again, famines, internal rebellions. There's a Nian rebellion um, and um, sort of local militarization, which is partly where the martial arts come from. Um, there is no state uh, security anymore. And so the villages are militarizing themselves you know, walled villages with their own um, small armies. And um, uh, so uh, as you're coming to the end of the century, um, there's a kind of increasing weakness of the empire. And uh, also the reformers are beginning to galvanize um, themselves and, uh, and challenge the dynasty and uh, actually the final child emperor. Um, and uh, so by 1911, you have um, uprisings all over China and eventually um, uh, the Republican army takes over. Um, so after that, there's a period, uh, there, there's a real um, attempt at modernization, at consolidation of a Republican and Democratic government, uh, but it falls apart rather quickly into warlordism. Um, so in the 20s and 30s, you are seeing that happen until um, the Japanese arrive with their own belief in the in their uh, supremacy uh, in the East Asian world. So uh, that was a very brutal invasion. Um, and they set up a puppet government in the Northeast um, but then uh, there ensues a war, a civil war between the Republicans and the communists, and the communists take over eventually in 1949. Uh, but many lives lost uh, in, in that civil war. Thereafter, in the 1950s, there were some serious errors of policy by Mao Zedong, and that ended in terrible famines. So... Um, this whole period of the first half of the 20th century um, was, was a devastating period for the population. After the 50s and the famines, I suppose, then there was a cultural revolution, actually. A lot of people died in the cultural revolution, which was um, inspired by Mao Zedong, and it was uh, intended uh, to produce a continuous revolution. Um, and to overturn the growing middle class or the intellectual class. Um, and uh, that was a time when there was a targeting of religion, of religious organizations, of uh, even of actually uh, uh, in, in the Chinese medical world, of all Western influence. So it was anti-Western, anti-religion, um, anti uh, those new bureaucracy, communist bureaucracy. And it ended in 1976 with the death of Mao Zedong and the Premier Zhou Enlai. Um, and from that point onwards, there's a sort of opening up to the West and a sort of uh, uh, financial, a, a new sort of um, opening up to economic reforms on Chinese terms, so sort of uh, uh, um, no longer the kind of collectivization of the early, 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 early communist period. What you're getting then is um, uh, small scale um, individuals 
and individual entrepreneurship, and then increasingly uh, larger until you get the sort of globalizing economy of the late 90s and 2000 and 2000s, yeah. It's crazy how I, I, I heard some people saying that they visited China like 40 years ago, 30 years ago, and it was basically... There is no uh, huge buildings. There is like they built everything in the last uh, the, the fast uh, and rapid uh, te- uh, technological and everything advanced. Uh, it's crazy. And uh, where do you attribute that? You think? Well, I I, I don't know. I'm not. You know, that's not. My period, and I'm not a historian uh, of the economy, but but just from a very personal point of view, uh, or or what I imagine to be the case, it's like um, China ha- has had this rapidly developing middle class in the urban peri- in the urban areas, but they still have an enormous population of people who are pretty poor and who form the workforce, the manufacturing basis of China. So um, uh, there are new managers and also sweatshops, um, mines full of people who don't have money, but they have enough money to keep them quiet, as it were. So, you know, those workers, you know, back in the, Back when I first visited in the 19, late, late 1980s, people hardly had TVs. They didn't have all the, all the trappings of a lifestyle. And it's almost as if in the socialist world generally, where the economy has taken off, the workers are kept almost entranced by TV, which is newly in their homes, for example, by the media, and so that they they're generally able to eat, <laughs> they can eat. They're not starving, and so they're not going to protest. But at the same time, the uh, differential between their their economic resources and the middle class, the the growing middle class in the cities, is enormous. So uh, that surely is um, a, it speaks of a possible unrest. But so far, it hasn't happened. It hasn't really happened. Um, I suppose because they have enough and because they live in the media fantasy about the world. Um, and um, and so everybody is rather frightened of, you know, it's within living memory, the wars and the famines of the past. So there is a sort of Chinese consensus of belief in the strong leader. Um And Xi Jinping is that strong leader. Um, So why has it happened? Because they have this manufacturing base. And so, you know, they've been exporting to us. And we've been, you know, the balance of payments is is once again has been in China's favor. Uh, There are many things that a strong government can do. And... um, I've worked a bit on uh, with people who uh, are involved in, for example, environmental policies, um, and um, you know, something the things that you could do in China because they have this top-down command economy and command politics that you couldn't do in India, for example, or in the UK. So, I remember once being in Beijing. It would have been in the late '90s when they decided to take all the diesel. Uh, vehicles off the street, they're gone overnight. I mean, probably they went somewhere else because, you know, China uh, at that time was a miracle of uh, recycling. Um, they never wasted anything. Um, and so, but, but, but you can do that in China. You can, you can uh, demand that something happens and it happens because of state control. Um, so, In a way, uh, that means that there are future possibilities which are much stronger and much more powerful for the globe because of the population, because it is uh, such a large population. So if they really, they're not doing the the changing of the coal mines and the uh, carbon power, but 
one um, would hope that at some point um, they they will come to a environmental policies which um, they can then implement for the whole population very quickly. Um, and I hold out hope for that. You know, they are the biggest p- p- producers of solar solar power, for example, and wind power. I remember I, I, I'm a great rider. I love horse riding. And I went riding in Mongolia, um, in a Mongolia, in the Chinese part of uh, Mongolia. Um, and the wind farms just go on and on forever. And they give free energy to everybody who lives in sight of those, um, those uh, wind machines. So, you know, they can do things because they have that uh, command politics. So just only hope that they choose to do the right things. Uh, I'm reading a book now, Destined for War. I don't know if you heard about this book. Uh, It's uh, about the United States and China and the history and the future. And it says that... uh, uh, a lot of bad things can happen. It's not uh, necessarily going to happen, but a lot of things, bad things can happen in the future with this uh, uh, conflict. So uh, I'm, I know this is not, not your territory as well, but what do you think is uh, the future holds with, uh, with the China rising and challenging the biggest power uh, right now, United States. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not really my thing in terms of uh, my academic work, but personally, it is because you know I have this great grandfather who, who was knighted by Queen Victoria for uh, his Anglo-Chinese uh, his service to Anglo-Chinese relations. So it's in my mind. And my father wrote forty cookery books, and uh, you know he was a diplomat culturally between China and the UK. Um, So it's important to me. And, you know, I watched Taiwan and the issue over, you understand the issue over Taiwan? Uh, I understand that uh, both of them won, uh, that the United States doesn't want China to control Taiwan. This is what I, I know. Sure. Um, and China believes that Taiwan belongs to it. It's part of the one China policy. So nobody talks about in China. You don't talk about China and Taiwan because Taiwan belongs to China. Um, and so but, it is. A- but I, 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 I spoke with one, the, the Chinese girl, and she told me that the Taiwanese people, they see themselves independent more or less in a way. Well, of course, in Taiwan, there are many non-Chinese people. Uh, you know, I suppose what you think of as First Nation Taiwanese. Um, and so they obviously don't think of themselves as, as Chinese. But then at, in 1949, the losing side, the Republican army and government moved from China to Taiwan um, and set up uh, the government there. Now, um, that was a really odd government because it claimed to be ruling China from Taiwan, which was a kind of total fantasy. Um, anyway, uh, in terms of whether there is going to be a conflict between um, China and America over this, I mean, one, one of the uh, uh, things that China, that America is very f- going to f- finds really hard to to deal with is China's growing influence in the world in Africa, in South America, in Europe. You know, it's financing so much of the enterprise in uh, Europe even and the UK even. Um, And so that reality is very hard for um, America to take because the balance of power is changing. China is also trying to assert itself diplomatically um, in areas which uh, the US thinks are their own international territory, as it were, um, and uh, particularly in Africa. And um, China pursues a very different policy. So it doesn't uh, barter human rights um, for economic investment, um, which is um, often seen by African governments as an interference in their own um, political uh, autonomy. Uh, they what China does is they interact with regimes which uh, which America would find offensive, 
um, but they do so um, um, they do so by um, uh, just doing the economic uh, the economics on an equal basis, or so they would believe themselves. Um, and so uh, they do also uh, aid. They've got a long tradition of aid in Africa um, and much appreciated initially by, by African states. So they would do uh, medical aid, agricultural aid. They built a fantastic train across Tanzania. It's just a sort of jewel in their crown. Um, and so China really feels that it has a sort of moral upper hand um, and you see it trying to intervene even now in um, international diplomacy in the Middle East, for example, um, and in Russia. So um, they have this strategy called the Belt and Road Strategy, um, where they are trying to really um, grease the wheels of the economy all the way from Vietnam through to to. Uh, uh, to the Middle East. So, what is um, the Africa, wheels of the economy means? It means that they are investing in the infrastructure so that that will uh, um, facilitate trade. Um, and and to do that, they are investing in aid for countries that need it, in the stands, for example, um, you know, Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, all those places which have enormous resources. So there's a battle for resources going on between America and China. That's a kind of subtext of a lot of what's happening. Um, and then it plays out most visibly around uh, Taiwan um, and the democracy issues in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, I think both China and the U.S., are going to be very reluctant to engage in open conflict. It would be too awful globally. Everybody knows that. Um, and so you see, um, even now, I think there was a there was an American a diplomatic mission to China. And I think that um, it is essential, from my point of view, that diplomacy is um, is is strengthened between China and America. I think that, yeah. you know, there's just a lot of hawkish stupidness um, about, um, about um, uh, not engaging with China. Obviously, one has to protect one's own economy. Um, and, uh, you know, China uh, <laughs> is keen to take over the world. But, um, and so that, you know, but, but economically, it doesn't really have to do it um, militarily. Uh, so I don't see that you know China is going to be the aggressor. Uh, it does. It, it is rattling over various islands. Is it going to invade Taiwan? I don't think it needs to. I think, it, in a sense, it's economically invaded already. So why would it need to upset the apple cart with a military invasion? It seem, would seem very stupid to me. Yes, it seems like the Chinese, after reading this book, they don't have. The, the culture of being the aggressor uh, in comparison to United well, States. Well, I think if you were Tibetan, you would you would you would uh, think that the Chinese was culturally the aggressor. But but no, we don't see uh, large scale invasions. There are skirmishes everywhere. Um, you know, there are skirmishes. There have been skirmishes around the Vietnam border and and in, and against Tibetan nationalists and independent movement in Xinjiang. You know, there's an enormous uh, uh, persecution of uh, the local people there, but but uh, no, I don't see them as uh, majorly aggressive militarily um, uh, for the rest of the world. There are places that it considers its own, including Taiwan, Tibet, Xinjiang, um, Hong Kong, and um, and the vast majority of people in China probably feel that as well. They feel that those places belong to China historically. But beyond that, I don't see it as having a, uh, a very aggressive military policy. It, it's, in, in it's, it's very interesting. I think, uh, to be honest, the uh, United States got a bit fooled 
uh, with the Ukraine war because I don't know. I believe uh, that uh, uh, it's obvious that it's not Ukraine fighting Russia here. It's the United States fighting Russia uh, mm. here. So mm. uh, maybe you disagree or something, but uh, I think that is kind of uh, weaken uh, the economy and the power. Slowly, slowly, if you are engaging in war, it's very costly. It's not. Uh, Uh, you are allocating resources that will give you stuff in the future if you in, invested in different ways and all this stuff. So it's uh, maybe the winner out of all this stuff, uh, conflict, it is China. It may be the case. Yeah, it may be the case. Um, uh, but we yet to see because China has its own economic problems. You know, it, it, the, the economic miracle of China cannot go on forever. Uh, and it is dependent on its um, its its market in the rest of the world, and the whole of the world has problems. So so um, um, one can't be sure that um, it doesn't have growing internal problems. I imagine it does, because the people in China uh, became so rich so quickly um, that uh, they have growing expectations of um, their lives. So that middle class that saw the economic miracle um, are quite hard pressed now because post COVID and post, um, you know, it's not that China doesn't have economic difficulties, it does. Um, so it's worried, um, but yes, on the international stage, um, I, I mean, I teach at University College London, we have, something like seven or eight or maybe even more thousand students who paid double fees. We couldn't survive without them. Um, and so, you know, that's a harsh reality um, that, that, that China is financing our educational institutions. What people get wrong about Chinese people in the West, uh, what people don't understand that you see the common mistakes? About what do people about China, get wrong? Like the the Western world, what they don't understand about the history, maybe about the culture, what people get wrong. I remember, uh, I remember reading a, a, a quote by Joe Biden uh, before, way before he was um, president of America, um, saying something like, uh, "And when did China?" ever produce anything of their own you know they don't they don't have one iota of innovation in them um and uh this goes back to a long-standing prejudice about uh, where you began with the industrial revolution china had no enlightenment and industrial revolution in the 18th century and people are always asking why and one of the people who sponsored me joseph needham um That was his big question. The Needham question was why China didn't have an industrial revolution. Um, so why didn't China modernize at the same rate? Given that they had this enormous technical um, uh, advantage over us in the sense that as, as we, we talked, you know, they had printing, the printing press, they had so much uh, technology, um, which was way in advance of, 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 of Europe at the time. So why didn't they have an industrial revolution? Um, I think, to me, it's a question. It's the wrong question. You know, we had an industrial revolution and uh, uh, an enlightenment that dated to a certain period and to a certain social context. Um, nobody quite understands why it happens, why it happened in Europe. You know, what what happened in Italy and in France and in England that uh, made those enormous leaps of. Um, engineering and scientific genius that shaped the modern world. But it is only 200 years. <laughs> um, what we see in the next 200 years, uh, it may be, you know, people talk about the China century, that this is going to be the China century. So I'm, you know, I'm not, uh, I can't see the future, but I would say that, um, you know, what happens in the next 100 years will make us think again about what happened in the previous 200 years. Um, so innovation in China, innovation, there is massive innovation in China. It just happens in different ways. 
So basically, your answer is that they don't understand the way that uh, China is innovating. Uh, they don't mm. understand uh, mm. the mm. the evolution of China as well. Of, mm. Uh, mm. And they're frightened. People are frightened because they don't understand. And actually, the most important thing is to understand China and to communicate with China. Um, and we have an upcoming generation who are educate, Chinese educated uh, outside of China who then, you know, we had a terrible language barrier before, um, but now those Chinese are speaking English and those Chinese are contributing to our education, both in terms of financing it, but also they are the next generation of, of graduates um, who have expertise globally and interest globally. So um, I'm fascinated. Well, I won't live to see how see what happens, but um, um, my prediction is uh, is um, that, um, that that China is going to be uh, leading many aspects of our future in the next century, if if, if not all the aspects. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> best to marry them is what I say. Being half Chinese is best to marry them. <laughs> Mix up the world. What do you mean? Mix up the world uh, uh, genetically. I'm I'm all for that. Oh, okay. Beyond nationalism, where can we go beyond nationalism? We only have to produce, you know, mixed 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 genetic people. Then, uh, to then en enhance the gene pool. <laughs> yes, enhance the gene pool. You'll get smarter, more innovative people all around. I would say That's that, wouldn't I? <laughs> Yes, because you are a product of that. So yes, exactly. You, are biased. <laughs> you might be biased a little bit. Though. A little bit biased. <laughs> yes, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not in favor of racial purity. <laughs> so I, I have. Uh, we talked a bit about the women rights in China and all this stuff. Like, do you think there is uh, still a problem there with equality and all this stuff? Do you, when you think. Uh, uh, like a hundred years ago was uh, wars, two thousand uh, hundred three hundred. Like the whole equality part with I don't know. Like we had in America, like with black people and equality. Do how does uh, that equality game played in China? Yes, I mean um, Mao Zedong famously said, "Women hold up half the world." Um, and there was certainly, you know, a drive towards equality uh, that came with communism. But actually, uh, like everywhere else, it's not even by now. Um, I did mention earlier that women's status is enhancing faster, I think, than, than, than men's in in China, but that's because of the massive rural po male population. Um, women often feel that, you know, there is a quite a macho Chinese culture. Um, and so that sustains itself. Um, but I think that is slowly changing. And I think that women are getting better educated. They're doing well. Um, they have greater mobility in urban environments. So um, will they become equal? They're not yet equal, but it's really changing, I think. So uh, again, let's see in the next uh, years. In the world, uh, there's a lot of racism against East Asians. Um, uh, there are sort of glass ceilings professionally. Um, but uh, uh, it's interesting that, 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 that um, East Asians uh, contribute very much to the tech industries, um, to uh, finance. Um, I'm in humanities, and I'm just beginning to see uh, a lot of Chinese wanting to study history, to study the arts, to study um, in that environment. And the reason why they couldn't before was because, the, you know, basically that kind of education is, is, is based on the essay and their English wasn't good enough, but it's getting better. And so um, we may be seeing um, 
Mori stations within uh, within the arts industries, the creative industries as well, and that will be an interesting thing. Because the culture, so far as I understood, when I visited in India, uh, China is to become a social worker to get a safe job. To it was yes. not that open to study literature or do philosophy or do all this. Well, exactly, uh, and because you know you can't see well with the, with the assault on the humanities in general worldwide in favor of the science and technology um, subjects. Um, you know, it's not encouraged either uh, by Chinese parents. They want their kids to, you know, yes. be financially comfortable. Um, but um, the kids themselves are choosing to do the art subjects now more than they used to. So I have a question that I ask every guest in the podcast, which is, I give you one trillion dollars. How do you spend it to improve this beautiful world that we are living in? Well, I'd have to say on the climate change stuff, wouldn't it? Be, wouldn't it be? It would be on investing in sustainable um, lifestyles. Okay, how? Like you give to scientists, you give to you are becoming Elon, the next Elon Musk. Like, how do you invest? And there are, Explain me a bit. Hmm. Um, well, you'd have to invest in the technologies, um, and um, to be honest, I think the state should be the states themselves should be investing in those technologies. So, would I do it personally? Um, I don't have. I don't have that. Um, I suppose what I would try and invest in is cross-cultural communication. And that would be consistent with everything you said. So uh, <laughs> the, 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 the communication for industries aimed at, um, at um, sustainable lifestyles that crossed boundaries, that crossed territories. And also through the arts, you know, engaging people through the arts as well into those sustainable lifestyles. But how you are going to do that? Where, like, do you create a company? Do you give it to the people? Like, work me a bit uh, through. Well, I, I've never imagined myself having trillions of dollars anyway. But so it's not a question that I've considered because I don't consider myself very powerful. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, but I think that, um, that, Within the arts situation, actually, you know, when I, as a historian, I'm very sad to see that we don't connect up, for example, medieval Chinese history with medieval European history. And I would like to see that happening. Um, do we know about the arts Chinese? I mean, that, you know, there are artists, Chinese artists working in, 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 in Europe and London and America, but, you know, it would be lovely to see that much more integrated. Um, because they're sort of individuals rather than um, at more large scale. Um, I would like to see uh, um, East Asia integrated in our education in Europe and the West, and, and also uh, more in you know more more um, wider education in the humanities in China too, um, over and above the technology of sustainable energy, for example. So, um, so bring, drawing the humanities into that cross cross cultural communication. Okay, I accept your answer. I'm not going to poke more to explain me <laughs> more. Well, how details. it would be done? So, how it would be done is is is, is, is super complex. But um, but actually, given that uh, you know, you and I can talk. I don't even know where you are. Um, so given a, in Los given, Angeles, you're in Los Angeles. Okay. So given that you and I can talk about China, uh, I'm in the southwest of France, in the middle of nowhere. And um, so you know, there's no reason that this kind of technology cannot facilitate those things without burning up the air miles. The air miles. <laughs> so uh, I in the beginning. You touched uh, briefly on the 
Chinese medicine and I express that I find it so weird how it was explained to me. Can you please explain to me the evolution a bit of Chinese medicine and why people hit their head when they have uh, pain in uh, some pain in the head or something? Because I don't know if that was, uh, is, is that true that was explained to me, but they told me that people are, when they have uh, some pain in the brain, they start to do this or something like that. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I actually, uh, I trained as an acupuncturist and uh, I never came across that specific technique. And, and as I said, that kind of technique comes from a, a Buddhist tradition um, where actually, and, and everything that I saw you doing, uh, is it Dengfeng in the Shaolin temples? Um is part of what's called the uh, diamond body traditions. And they involve beating the body and uh, really harsh training. Like uh, I was laughing seeing you standing on those poles, you know, um, and they, they, um, they really do harsh things. A lot of that was showmanship, you know, that a lot of it was uh, things that they would do at temple fairs to impress the public. And they still do it, you know. Um, my son and daughter, I put them in the Shaolin boot camp in Beijing um, while I was doing some research there. And uh, I watched those kids and I thought, you know, if you did that in Europe, you'd have the social services coming down on you for child abuse. Um, but um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, and, you know, I often see them entertaining around the world in, in, in London, for example, they come to London and they do their, they do their performances. And, you know, those kids are, are doing things that you could never do to European children. Um, but um, so there is this um, beating of the body to make it uh, into a diamond body, to train it to be resilient and to be strong. This is quite different to the traditions that grew up in China, which were part of a healing um, therapeutic body movement to which Tai Chi, which Tai Chi is a pretty modern thing, but, but those kind of qi working techniques uh, belong to that indigenous Chinese um, uh, tradition. And that's what I work on. That's my expertise. Um, a lot of that was martial, but it was also not martial. It was to do with therapy and to do with cultivation or perhaps breath meditation where you'd be aiming at achieving uh, unity with heaven and earth and p possibly immortality or different ideas about long life and immortality. Um, so, so you're saying that, yeah, you are beating. So at the same time, uh, there's something about the creative use of pain in China, um, which you meet in acupuncture. So, for example, um, when you put a needle in, you expect to have a certain pain. Now, that pain isn't seen as a bad thing. It's seen as a good thing. It catalyzes a movement of, of qi in the body. Um, and so um, there is the kind of qi movement where you expect the qi to move somewhere else. So you, you stimulate it at one place, maybe in the little toe, and you expect that it has an impact on the whole of the body. Uh, there are other kinds of needles where ne where they say ah oh, sure so that that's where you press on the body and it's painful and so then you would put Wait, the needle. Am, in. am I hearing correctly that they are saying that pain is a good thing? Uh, that pain can be quite a good thing in um, in for example the very physical direct techniques. So for example, if you have a pain in your body, sometimes one of the ways of treating it would be by putting needles into that pain. And that would, um, wow. or, or maybe um, massaging the painful places. And that's something that actually is universal, you know, that actually if you feel a certain amount of pain in a, a part of your body, if it's not very acute pain, if it's a sort of sore pain, um, then, then sometimes massage really releases it because it's related to the tension. And it's very local, very physical. So you can relieve a, a very tight tendon muscle by, by massage. 
Um, and that's something that everybody knows, actually. I mean, you know it instinctively. If you have, if you have tension, in, <clears throat> I'm always massaging <clears throat> the back of my neck because I get tense there and it relaxes, I feel better. So <clears throat> there are certain types of pain that you wouldn't massage because, you know, like heat or inf- the pain from inflammation if you've hurt yourself and um, you're inflamed, uh, then you don't really want to be agitating that particular thing. So if you've got an acute problem, that's not the thing. But if you've got a chronic problem, then doing that. And then the other thing is moxa. Have you ever come across moxa? Moxa is uh, Uh, something that you burn, burn on the body. And in the ancient world, they used to do it quite seriously so that you'd have blistered skin. These days, they don't do it so badly like that. But it's like deep heat treatment. So, you know, you can, you can buy those creams in the chemist where you, where, you, where you put it on your sore muscles and it relaxes them. The uh, Chinese have better techniques for that. So the, the, the heat really um, penetrates deep into the body. Um, and so um, I, I love those things, you know. Those are sort of household things which you can just use in your first aid kit. Um, for um, for uh, for just getting yourself moving. That's one of the wonderful things. I always think that in in the UK, Chinese migration to the UK was always about immediate gratification. So, for example, uh, they start with the laundries, Chinese, you know, the the, the washing clothes, and um, that industry gets killed by uh, the washing machine. <laughs> so um, then they change to fast food. And I think there must be the first fast food in the UK. Um, so uh, that's on the high street in the same shops as the laundry was in. And, and then <laughs> then you have Chinese medicine shops that started up um, in the sort of 80s after the 80s. And, you know, there are places where you can just go in and you've got a bad back and you can get your back moxed and massaged and you walk out feeling um, fast, 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 uh, fast medicine free. Um, and that's one of the great wonders of Chinese commerce around the world, that, um, that, that at the base level, I'm not talking about Silicon Valley, but uh, I'm talking about uh, on your high street, they, they give you things that gratify your senses um, um, fast, <laughs> where we never had anything like that in the UK and, before. And in China, I, w- I did foot massage, and it's quite popular there, like... Every street that you walk, there is a strip massage uh, uh, place. That, uh, and that so, massage, yes. Chinese massage can be quite painful. Yes, yeah, that's the best massage ever. Exactly. Uh, when, when, there, when there is no pain, there is no gain. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so I wrote here a question, and it is, I don't know if it's tricky or not, but when the first medicine in history really appeared, like in a way for people to treat in their illnesses with something? First ever in history. Oh my goodness. I have no idea. And the thing is that uh, with an academic, you have to define what you mean by medicine. Um, and so, for example, I was talking to you about the Shang dynasty. So um, uh, what they used to do in the Shang dynasty was uh, divine to see which of your ancestors was causing you problem right now. And Ooh. the uh, and so, you know, it might be your great grandfather is displeased with you for something. He's dead, but he's displeased with you. Um, and so therefore he's causing your illness. And then the important thing to, to remedy that is to sacrifice to your ancestor. Okay. Is that medicine? Wow. So what, what thing to sacrifice? Like a goat Probably or something? Sacrifice a sheep. <laughs> no, sacrifice a sheep to your ancestor. Um, if you're talking about acupuncture, this is really what I'm doing right right now in my work. If you're talking about acupuncture and uh, what we think of as Chinese medicine today, uh, you can see a lot happening just before the empire begins. So um, we, I read those manuscripts that they take from um, from uh, uh, the tombs. I told you about them. In fact, I've got one here. I'll show you. 
Come on. It's very beautiful. Please. So they, they're, they're built, they're written on bamboo strips. Can you see the strips of bamboo? Yeah. So wow. I translated this one recently. Um, and that is on um, the earliest piece piercing techniques. Um, and it gives you lists of illnesses and uh, it tells you how many times to pierce the body and where to pierce. Um, and so uh, that dates to about... Um, 160 BC, something wow. like that. Um, and it, at that time, we know a lot from the tombs because people were buried with not only their libraries, but also medical instruments um, and herbs and foodstuffs. Um, so to sustain them in the, um, the coming world. Um, and so um, we see uh, this developing from ideas about heaven and earth but also coming together with uh, practices of surgery. So a lot of people suffered from, in the ancient world, they suffered from growths and, and tumors of one kind or another. So, you know, they would be cutting those or bursting those. And, and then ideas of, there were many different types of needles. Some of them are surgical. Some, wow. of, them from, some of them from moving, so moving chi. It, wa it was... They did surgeries two thousand years ago. Wow, it's fine. Yeah, they can only, they can only do pretty pretty superficial surgery. You know, where you have um, lumps and bumps and abscesses, abscesses often, um, or maybe if you ret retain urine. You know, when you get old, very often people retain urine in their bladders. So ways in which you can release the urine from um, the bladder, that kind of thing. Wow. Hmm. So, so I, I, I didn't tell you about the world. I'm telling you about China particularly um, because I don't really know and, about the world <laughs> globally. And, and how do you, so mostly, you say, as you said, it's archaeological findings that we know these things hmm. from the, from the hmm. places that they bear, that they, that they, the de that they put the dead inside. Yeah. It was... And, and they're not only the the emperor. In fact, uh, some of the new um, biological ways of um, of testing people. So, for example, when the first emperor made his tomb, he used slaves, convicts, to build it. And he was very superstitious, didn't want people to know where... Um, uh, the place was built, so basically killed them all afterwards, or they died anyway. And so people have done investigations into what they died of, you know, and if they weren't murdered, executed, then they were they were dying from malnutrition and from all kinds of horrible dis horrible diseases of the of poverty and abuse. Um, so uh, a lot of um, abscesses actually, so poisonous abscesses probably. Mm. Wow. So, and the, w this is kind of a, a, not a weird topic uh, for you to get into, but how did you get into this topic? History of medicine? Of, yeah. Well, I talked to you a little bit about my dissolute youth. <laughs> um, and uh, so at 13... I was taking a lot of psychedelics, LSD and, and all sorts of drugs. Um, and I was also learning martial arts. I did every kind of martial arts from um, karate, every kind of karate and um, kung fu, aikido um, and, uh, and tai chi. And it was particularly my tai chi teacher who was this Australian woman who... Um, um, took me under her arm and I was teaching with her. And then I bumped into loads of acupuncturists and I thought, well, I'd quite like to learn that too. Um, and so um, even while I was living this crazy lifestyle in London, uh, I was somehow sustaining myself through my practice. And then it was children that completely put me on the straight and narrow. So I had my first child at 21. And by that time, um, I was working as an acupuncturist. Um, and so um, 
I worked in London as an acupuncturist, and then I got much more into going to China, so I spent a lot of time in China. And to be honest, uh, I was being taught by Europeans, and I didn't really believe they knew very much about what they were teaching me. So uh, I decided to start at the beginning, and I, I, I um, got into Cambridge University and studied Chinese in Cambridge University. And then after that... Um, how did I get into Chinese uh, Cambridge University? That was a kind of fluke, <laughs> but um, but um, anyway, they took me, um, and I did very well, and haven't looked back in terms of my academic work. So you know that's been the um, I, I now no longer treat with Chinese medicine, although I did for ten years have a clinic in central London, um, and I do do practice. And uh, now I'm retiring from 20, 20, 30 years of teaching um, and I'm developing a did retreat you got, center. Did, did you got bored of teaching and like you're excited of the next part of this? Or you are, I'm 66 are you... this year. And so next year I'm 67 and I'm just up for retirement. I'm not bored. It's, and I'm going to continue research. I'm, I'm developing a research center down here for my own research. Uh, but also for doing lots of things like um, I told you, I invited you to join me in my uh, my animal qigong workshop down here. Um, so I'm teaching history and movement and um, philosophy of of uh, Chinese body techniques overall. Um, how to move like how to walk like a bear and rise like a dragon. That's what I'm interested and, in. And I watch martial and, arts films. Uh, I love the martial arts films. Uh, can you explain why Chinese people are so crazy about dragons? <laughs> well, there are many dragons, many kinds of dragons. Um, and, uh, uh, and because they are one of the Sisyang, the four animals of the cosmos so uh there's the red bird of the south the white tiger of the east the black turtle of the north and the uh the blue dragon of the west and they're associated with the um uh the mountains and the rain and the clouds um and uh they are um just part of the mythical world that makes up china um, and so uh, the dragon is the the probably the most powerful of the elements, but they they're not particularly. I don't think that they're particularly moral, <laughs> um, uh, although they represent power uh, generally, and so they can be used, manipulated for 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 the good, I suppose. Um, and then uh, the dragon is also a representative of the emperor. So it brings with it um, the one China idea, the, um, the power of the Chinese uh, ruler. Interesting. Yeah. So it's a mythical creature that is beloved by the Chinese people and became massively adapted as like a symbol of uh, power. Yes, that's right. Um, Okay. I and, I have yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, something funny happened with my computer. But carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. You are awesome. <laughs> Why I'm you what? chose to live what? So, sorry, tell me again. I said I, I love you. You are awesome. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> That's very sweet of you. <laughs> uh, I've, my question is about. Uh, so you mentioned that you are now living in France. Am I hearing correctly? That's right. And why you chose France for the I had, I had friends here, but this southwest area of France is uh, a, a beautiful area. It's in the foothills of the Pyrenees. And I've bought a farm where we have many horses and dogs. And uh, because I just like to live in the uh, in the in in the countryside, um, 
I probably didn't tell you, but you know, one of the one of the things I, I became very ill at some point. So although I've been, always been rather fit, um, I've had many illnesses. Like I had a stroke where I lost my memory and my eyesight, and I and then I had cancer and I lost my womb, and then I had my hip changed. So I thought I have to come somewhere. Um, some, somewhere quiet and peaceful to live out the rest of my days. Actually, I got rather better. Um, and so now I have to think about another life, another lifetime. Um, and so um, I live here with my animals, particularly a husky. Uh, and um, I don't know if you know anything about huskies, but my husky was an alpha male husky, and he made a lot of trouble in London. Um, and he liked to run far. So... I ride my horses. I have one wild horse and one tame horse, and the wild horse is being trained. But I go riding in the forest. I have 20 kilometers of forest just off my farm here. And uh, I, I ride with my dogs um, in the forest, and I don't see anybody. So I need a sort of freedom. And I can pretend to myself there's no loss of diversity because we have everything here, every kind of, every kind of deer and wild pig, an eagle and um and and rat <laughs> and and snakes and everything we have here and um so i just it's a it's a sort of paradise for me but i'm also setting up a a retreat um which is uh teaching things like a, a therapeutic movement and history of china we have yoga retreats and um and maybe writing retreats I'm going to start. So, you know, I'm developing this as my, my end of life project and I carry on writing and, and uh, reading. Well, now it sounds a bit exciting for me to visit, hopefully in the future. Yeah, <laughs> we'll come to my animal Qigong retreat in September. But <laughs> I, I, I have a question now that you mentioned that you... You wanted to live the last years of your life there and all this stuff. What do you want to leave behind in this beautiful world? I left behind quite a lot already. I've got a lot of children <laughs> and, and grandchildren. Um, so I want them to be happy, obviously. But I would like also to, to carry on something that's been in my family uh, for all these years. Uh, since my great grandfather was knighted by Queen Victoria, at a lesser level, to be involved in that intercultural communication, so um, to bring together um, both wisdom and culture of China with um, with uh, European ideas. So something um, which is the reason it's nice to be here talking to you. Okay, that's interesting. So can you elaborate a bit more to how, let's say, like this uh, podcast like this will achieve that? Well, um, in part, it's by sponsoring the humanities because, you know, there's been such an assault on the humanities and um, funding for the humanities generally that, you know, we need history. We need to understand the past in order to to shape the future. So uh, that understanding of the past in order to shape the future to my mind, has to embrace an intercultural history. Um, and that's what I have contributed through my lifetime. Um, and you can see that through um, in, through my eyes happens medically. So um, understanding uh, the use of uh, cultivation of this, the, the ways in which one, uh, one cultivates the physical movement and the spirit um, through Chinese practices, I think it's really valuable and something that should be uh, developed in the contemporary world. I think it is being developed, but it's often developed without a historical base, without an understanding of where it came from. And that I hope I have already contributed to. I've got lots of books, two of them are online, so it's easy for people to see. One, the Routledge History of Chinese Medicine um, is is you can find online and there's like five or 600 pages of, of, of history of medicine in China there and open for everybody to read. And so I'm very proud that that's um, available. Um, food ways. Um, and here in a smaller way, you know, I have, I'm not going to be running these retreats and um, inviting people to join me and thinking about food, thinking about um, um, 
history of movement, but also watching martial arts films, which is one of my great joys. Um, for the future, what I leave behind, um, you know, hopefully people, all the students that I've taught um, who uh, understand a bit better about the history of China and um, uh, and also how to speak to a British public or an English language public uh, about, you know, a lot of them are Chinese themselves. So, you know, how to communicate about their culture in the modern world. Yeah. Well, that was the most beautiful 12 hours and 10 minutes of, of my life. <laughs> <laughs> you you have a silver tongue. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to lie. I I love your energy. Like you are, you are quite calm. Uh, and it's like when, I don't know, I speak with you, it's like I, it feels very relaxing. And I'm mm. sure the viewers now feel the same as well. So yeah, it's very nice. beautiful for me to hang out with you. And thank you, thank you, thank you for well, being Well, thank this. you for inviting me, Phidias. Let me know if anything comes of it.